Chapter 40 Will Onsford race back through the forest of the wilderness, following the dark rut of the pathway as it tunnelled ahead through mist and gloom, trailing limbs and vines, heavy with dampness, brushed and slapped at him as he ran, and water splattered from puddles dotting the rain-soaked trail, leaving him streaked with mud. But the Valman felt none of it, his mind crowded with emotions that spun and twisted, to leave them dazed in despair at the loss of the offzone, anger against the fellow, fear for Amberley, and wonderment at the words she had spoken to him. I care for you, she said. She had said, and meant it. I care for you. So strange to hear her say such a thing to him. Once he would never have believed it possible. She had resented and mis- mistrusted him. She had made their, that clear enough. And he had not really liked this elven girl. But the long journey they had begun in the village of Havenstead had taught them much about each other and the dangers and hardships they had faced and overcome had brought them close. Their lives in that brief span of time had become intrinsically bound to, together. It, it was not really so unexpected than that of of that binding should come from form of affection. The words throbbed in his head, repeating themselves. I care for you. She did, he knew, and wondered suddenly how much he in turn now cared for her. He lost his footing and went down, tumbling forward into the muck and the damp. Angrily he scrambled up, brushed the mud and water away as best he could and ran on. The afternoon was waning far too quick, too rapidly. He would be forgotten. He would be fortunate just to regain the main roadway before nightfall set in. When that happened, he would have to find his way to- back in total darkness. Alone in an unfamiliar land, weaponless, save for a hunting knife. Stupid. That was the kindest description he could render for what he had done. Letting the fellow fool him into thinking that he could have the rover's aid for nothing more than a vague promise. Clever, Will Lumford, he chided himself. Anger burning through him, and Alanon had thought that you were the one to whom he might safely entrust Amberley. Already his muscles were beginning to cramp with the strain of running. Despair washed through him for a moment as he thought of all that Amberley and he had endured to reach this point, only to face losing everything for want of a bit more caution. Seven elven hunters had given their lives so that he and Amberley might reach the wilderness. Countless more would have already died defending the Westland against the demon, for surely the forbidding had given way by now. All for nothing, then all to no end but this. Shame and then determination rushed through him, carrying away the despair. He would never give up, never he would retrieve the stolen elf stones. He would return to Amberley. He would see her safely to Spire's Reach, to the blood fire, and back once more to Arbelon. He would do all this because he knew that he must, because to do anything less would be to fail. Not just Eleanor and the Owls, but himself as well. He was not about to do that. Even as, as the thought passed from his mind, a shadow appeared in the trail ahead materialising out of the gloom like some wraith, tall and silent, as it awaited his approach. The Valman drew up short, frightened so badly that he very nearly bolted from the pathway into the forest, breathing raggedly. He stared at the shadow, realising suddenly that what he was looking at was a horse and rider. The horse shifted on the trail and stamped, will walk forward cautiously, Weariness turning to disbelief and finally to astonishment. It was Eretria. Surprise? Her voice was cool and measured. Very, he admitted. I have come to save you one last time, Will Umford. This time I think you will hear better what I have to say. Will came up to her and stopped. Sir fellow has the stones. I know that. He drugged your ale, then took them from you the night last night while you slept. And you did nothing to warn me? Warn you? She shook her head slowly. I would have warned you, Hila. I would have helped you out. But you would not help me. Remember? All that I asked you was that you take me with you when you left. Had you done that, 
I would have told you as a fellow's plans for the officer and would have seen to it that you kept them safe. But you spurned me, Hila. You left me. You thought yourself able to manage well without me. Very well, I decided. I will see how well the healer does without me. She bent down to examine him, her eyes appraising. It does not appear that you are doing so well. Will nodded slowly, his mind racing. This was no time to say something foolish. Amberly is hurt. She fell and twisted her leg. Cannot walk. I had to leave her at the rim of the hollows. You seem very good at leaving women in distress, Eritrea snapped. He held his temper. I guess it must appear that way, but sometimes we cannot always do what we want to do when it comes to helping others. So you have said, I guess that you must believe it. Have you left the elven girl then? Only until I get the stones back. Which you won't without me. Which I will, with or without you. The rover girl still the rover girl stared down at him for a moment, and her face softened. I guess you believe that too, don't you? Will put his hand on his on the horse's flank. Are you here to help me, Eritrea? She regarded him wordlessly for a moment, then nodded. If you, in turn, will help me, this time you must, you know. When he did not respond, she continued speaking. A trade, Will Armsford, I will help you get back the stones if you agree to take me with you when you have them back again. How will you get the stones back, he asked carefully. She smiled for the first time, that familiar, dazzling, beautiful smile that took his breath away. How will I do it? Hela, I'm the child of rovers and the daughter of a thief, bought and paid for. He stole from he stole them from you. I will steal them, steal them from him. I know the trade better than he. All we need to do is find him. Won't he be wondering about you now? She shook her head. When we parted company with you, I told him that I wished to ride ahead to join the caravan. He agreed that I could. For the paths of the wilderness are well known to the rovers, and I would be clear of the valley by nightfall. As you know, Hila, he wants to be certain that he keeps me safe. Damage good, bring poor price. In any case, I rode but a mile beyond Whistle Ridge, then took a second trail that cuts south and joins this one several hundred yards further back. I thought to catch up to you by nightfall, either at the hollows or coming back this way, should you discover sooner the loss of the stones. So you see, Sir Fellow will not realise what I have done until he reaches the main caravan. The wagon slows him, so he will not do that until sometime tomorrow. Tonight he will camp on the road leading out of the valley. Then we have tonight to get back the stones, Will finished. Time enough, she replied. But not if we continue to stand here and talk about it. Besides, you don't want to leave the Elven girl alone in the hollows for very long, do you? The mention of Amberley jarred him. No, let's be off. One moment, she backed the horse away from him. First, your word. Once I have helped you, then you will help me. You will take me with you when we have the stones back. You will not let me stay with you after that until I am a safe distance from the fellow. And I will decide when that is the case. Promise me, Healer. There's very little else that he could do, short of taking her horse from her, and he was not at all sure that he could do that. Very well, I promise. She nodded. Good. Good to see that you keep the promise. I will keep the stones once I have taken them back from it again until we are both safely out of this valley. Climb up behind me. Will mounted the horse without comment. There was no way that he was about to let her keep the elf stones once she had retrieved them from Cephalo, but it was pointless to argue about it here. He settled himself behind the girl and she turned to look at him. You do not deserve what I am doing for you. You know that, but I like you. I like your chances in life, especially with me to aid you. Put your hands about my waist. Will hesitated, but then as he then did as he was told. Retro leaned back into him. Mm, much better. She purred seductively. I prefer you this way to the way you are when the elven girl is about. Now hold tighter. With a sudden yell, she put her boots into the flanks of the horse. The startled beast rested up with a stream.
screaming, shot back along the pathway, down the wilderness trail they rode, bent low across the horse's back, neck, limbs whisp, whipping past them as they flew through the dark. Retro seemed to have the eyes of a cat, guiding their mount with a sure and practiced hand, past fallen logs and debris over gullies and ruts formed by the sudden rain. Down one muddied slope and up the next, Will hung on desperately, wondering if the girl had lost her mind at this pace they were certain to take a fall. Amazingly, they did not. Scant seconds, scant seconds later, Eritrea wheeled their horse from the trail through a narrow gap in the trees that was all but completely grown over. With a surge, the animal sprang into the brush then broke free along a second trail, one that Will missed completely on, in its tracks out to the hollows and galloped ahead into the misty gloom. On their road, Rover and Girl, Rover Girl and Valman, barely slowing for the obstacles that barred their path forward. Racing ahead into the growing dark, what little light there was had begun to fade as dusk approached. The sun, lost somewhere beyond, beyond the canopy of the forest, sank downward into the rim of the mountains. Shouters, shadows deepened and the air cooled and still Eritrea did not slow. When at last they did stop, they were back once more on the main roadway. Eritrea reined the horse in sharply, patted the animal's sweating flanks and glanced back at Will with an impish grin. That was just to let you know that I can hold my own with anyone. I need no looking after her from you. The Valman felt his stomach begin to settle. You have made your point, Eritrea. Why are we stopping here? Just to check, she replied and dismounted. Her eyes scanned the trail for a few moments and then she frowned. That's odd. There are no wagon tracks. We've followed her down. Are you sure? He studied the roadway, finding no sign of wheel mark. Maybe the rain washed them out. The wagon was heavy enough that the rain should not have washed away all traces of its passing. She shook her head slowly. Besides, the rain would have been nearly ended by the time it reached this point. I don't understand it, Hila. The light was growing steadily dimmer. We we'll glanced about apprehensively. Would Savello had stopped to wait out the storm? Maybe. She looked doubtful. We had better tra backtrack a bit. Climb on. They remounted and began riding west, glancing from time to time at the muddy dirt for some sign of the rover wagon. There was nothing. Retria urged their mountain to a slow trot. Ahead, mist curled out of the forest on either side. Thin. Wispy trailers that slipped like feelers through the gloom. Night sounds came from deep within the trees as the creatures of the followers of the valley awoke and began to hunt. Then a new sound rose from somewhere ahead, faint at first, lingering like an echo in the midst of the sharper, quicker sound, then stronger and more insistent. It grew into a howl, high-pitched and eerie, as if such pain had been inflicted upon some tortured soul that the limits of endurance had been passed and all that was left before death was that final terrible cry of anguish. Will gripped Eritrea's shoulder in alarm. What is that? She glanced back. Whistle Ridge, just ahead. She grinned nervously. The wind makes that sound sometimes. It grew worse, a harsher, more biting cry, and the lamb began to rise through the forest to a rocky slope. It took them above the mist, the trees parting to reveal small patches of blue night sky. The horse had begun to respond to the sounds, huffing nervously, dancing and shifting as Retria sought to calm it. They moved more slowly now, edging ahead through the dusk until they were atop the bridge line. Beyond the roadway straightened once more and disappeared into the gloom. Will saw something then, a shadow moving toward them. Materialising out of the howl of the wind and the night, Eritrea saw it as well and reined in sharply. The shadow came closer. It was a horse, big, sorrel, riderless, its reins trailing in the earth, came slowly up to them and rubbed noses with their own mount. But Valman and Rovergill recognised it as once. It was the fellows. Eritrea dismounted, handing the reins of her own horse to Will. Wordlessly, she examined the horse, walking quickly about it, patting its flanks and neck, 
to keep it calm. There were no marks on the animal, but it was sweating heavily. When she glanced again at it at will, Eritrea's dark face was uncertain. Something has happened. His horse would not stray. The Valman nodded. He was beginning to get very bad feelings about this. Eritrea climbed the tops of Fellow's horse and took up the reins. We'll go on a bit further, she decided, but there was doubt in her voice. Side by side, they rode along the ridge line, the wind whistling its airy cry through the high rock in the trees of the forest. Overhead, the stars winked into view, pale white light shining down into the dark of the wilderness. Then something else appeared through the gloom, another shadow, this one black and squarish and motionless upon the trail. Valman and Rovergirl slowed, easing their horses ahead, cautiously uneasiness reflecting in their eyes. Gradually, the shadows began to take shape. It was the fellow's wagon. The garish colours caught in the starlight. They rode closer, and uneasiness then turned to horror. The team of horses that had pulled the wagon were dead, twisted and broken, still locked in their leather and silver-studded traces. Several more of the animals lay close by, and then their riders scattered on the trail like straw men, torn and crumpled, bright clothing stained with blood that seeped through the fabric to mix with the muddy dirt. Quickly, Will looked about, peering into the shadows of the forest, searching for some sign of the thing that had done this. Nothing moved. He glanced at Eritrea. She sat rigid on her mount, the colour draining from her face as she stared fixedly at the bodies. 